Good morning, it's Michael Checker, and at this time every day this week, we are having one of our BBC Radio Devon Christmas lectures. We're hearing from an expert in their field, someone who can share their passion for what they know best about. And today we are exploring the world's oceans and seas, something that's very close to heart to many people in the southwest of England, of course. And our expert today, our guest lecturer, Dr Lee Demora from Plymouth Marine Laboratory. I'm Dr Lee Damara and I work here in Devon at PML, which is a registered environmental charity. Our building's on Plymouth Hoe, but at the West End, so possibly not the marine laboratory that you're thinking of. My job is to develop, monitor and evaluate computer simulations of the climate with a focus on the ocean. The primary project that I've been working on is the United Kingdom Earth System model. This is a state-of-the-art climate simulation and it's one of the most advanced simulations of its kind in the world. Earth system models are important because they are the only way that we can make realistic forecasts of the future climate. They allow us to make predictions about where the climate is heading and include tools to forecast things like air temperature, wind, storminess, marine life, uh, land fires, sea ice, glaciers, agricultures, and all sorts of key climate indicators. So you may be familiar with weather models, which make predictions over specific regions and short time spans, so we're talking weeks, but climate models are actually much broader and cover much longer time spans, so decades up to centuries. The way that climate models are put together is that we develop models for each component separately and then stitch them together. So in the UKSM, this means we have uh, several component models. So in the atmosphere, we have circulation, aerosol, dust, and clouds. On land, we have uh, land ice, so glaciers, vegetations, fire, and land use. And in the ocean, we have uh, sea ice, marine circulation, and marine biology. So each individual model will have been developed by a team of experts in their field. And each model is able to be run and tested individually. So we make sure that the behavior matches historical observations and lab experiments separately. Once we have a good understanding of how each component model works on its own, we then connect them together. And the connections reflect the ways that those systems interact in nature. So those connections will include things like precipitation, rain falling from the atmosphere onto the surface, uh, rivers flowing into the sea, water evaporating, uh, wind blows and picks up dust from the land surface, Plants will absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, um, sea ice will melt into the ocean, and lots of stuff like that. But this doesn't actually answer the question of what does the model look like. Uh, in our ocean model, we'll take a map of the global ocean and then divide it up into little boxes. And in our model, each box is around 100 by 100 kilometers across. And there's 75 of these boxes stacked on top of each other between the sea surface to the seafloor. And just like in the real ocean, each individual box has distinct local properties. So each box of water will have its own temperature, salinity, currents, and other physical and chemical and biological properties. Each of these properties can change over time as well. And each box will interact with its neighboring boxes. So water can flow from one box to the other. And it, as it flows, it will take the heat, salt, and other properties with it as it moves. Each little box of the ocean also contains a marine ecosystem model. And the, the box contains microscopic plants and animals called phytoplankton and zooplankton, and they're floating around in the water. And the water, just like soil on land, contains nutrients that the phytoplankton consume and use to grow. And just like on land, the plants are eaten by the herbivores and the herbivores are eaten by carnivores. And when they die, phyto uh, the plankton are biodegraded by bacteria, which release nutrients back into the ocean. Or they form detritus, which can be suspended or sink to the seafloor. And once we have a set of values for each box, so temperature, salinity, nutrients, phytoplankton concentration, and so on, we then take a step forward in time and move the model forwards an hour, for instance. Um, the earth will turn, uh, light will get brighter or darker, the ocean sloshes around, and the wind blows. So in our little ecosystem as well, some of the plants will have been consuming nutrients, some of the carnivores will have eaten the herbivores, uh, one population goes up and the other population goes down. And also the current will have moved some water from in from the neighboring box and pushed some water out the other side. So once we've run through this entire process and recalculated the contents of each box, the results are then saved and we're ready to move forward another hour. And this exact process happens in all the other component models as well. So we divide them up into stacks of boxes and then we try to understand what's happening inside each box. And we move forward an hour and we record the changes. But we also need to understand how things transfer from one box to another when different model components touch. 
So this could be the water and ice, or air and ocean, or land and air, for instance. So in the air-ocean interface, uh, we need to think about things like precipitation, wind, sea spray, aerosol, gas, dust, and heat, all being exchanged from air and sea and back again. So some of these behaviors can also chain up and go between several models in one go. So let's take, for example, a speck of dust that the wind picks up from the desert in Australia. That dust starts in the land surface model, and then it passes up into the atmospheric circulation model, which carries it in the air. So while it's being blown around, it's acted upon in the atmospheric chemistry model. So it may break up or oxidize. Uh, it may attract water and then join a cloud in the aerosol and cloud model. After some time, it will be deposited on the surface, either through precipitation or dry deposition. So let's say that that dust uh, lands on an iceberg. So it could contribute to changing the color of the ice and make it less reflected of sunlight. So then the iceberg starts to absorb more heat and starts to melt. So once the ice is melted, the dust is then dissolved in the surface ocean, and it will follow the current in the marine circulation model. And then as a dissolved nutrient, it may be consumed by phytoplankton, or, and then the phytoplankton is consumed by zooplankton, and then it becomes part of the food web. And each step that the dust took along the way is governed by a mathematical function that reflects how the connection behaves in nature. And that's the essence of modeling. In the second half of today's lecture, I'll be talking about how we simulate the recent past, the present day and the future, and how these models can influence international climate change policy. part two of today's BBC Radio Devon Christmas lecture in just a moment. And if you found that quite complex, then rest assured the next part is much simpler and the message is stark. Good morning, I'm Michael Checker and we are in the middle of today's BBC Radio Devon Christmas lecture. Our lecturer today, Dr Lee DeMora from Plymouth Marine Laboratory, has been talking about climate change modelling. Now the first part, quite complex, quite scientific, quite technical. The second part, much simpler and with a really, really important message. Have a listen to this. In the first part, we talked about how Earth system models are put together, and now we're moving on to how we run and use the model. Once we have the full Earth system model set up, if we were just to leave this model running, it would behave like nature without any human influence. However, if we want to simulate a realistic climate, we need to include some of the impacts that humanity has made on the environment. This means that the model needs to include changes like the gradual rise in the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. We also need to include how land use has been changed by humanity in terms of urbanization, deforestation and changes in farming practices. It's important to say that we don't force the model temperature to change. Temperature change is the consequence of including human influence on the climate. It's never explicitly forced into the model. It's also worth taking a moment to discuss how human influence actually does affect the climate. We've mentioned this already, but carbon dioxide is produced by burning fossil fuels. And before the Industrial Revolution, there was around 280 carbon dioxide molecules for every million molecules in the air. And now that value is up to 420 parts per million and rising. Um, not to get too scientisty, but the greenhouse warming mechanism is actually quite interesting. But it's also not so complicated. Greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide are transparent to most sunlight, but opaque for radiation given off by the Earth in the infrared. So well, it's quite easy for sunlight to pass through the atmosphere on the way down. But when the sunlight hits the Earth's surface, it's absorbed as heat energy and then re-emitted as infrared radiation. So it becomes much harder for it to get out of the atmosphere again. And the more greenhouse gases we have, the worse this problem becomes. And the ocean also absorbs some of the carbon dioxide emitted by burning fossil fuels. In water, carbon dioxide becomes carbonic acid, and in large quantities it can change the pH of the ocean in a process called ocean acidification. Ocean acidification can be responsible for coral bleaching events and other significant changes in the marine environment. Humanity has also had a significant impact on the climate through deforestation, burning biomass, water extraction, marine pollution, and habitat loss. Looking to the future, we don't know how human behavior will change, if at all. In models, we take this into account by running the model with several plausible scenarios for emissions of greenhouse gases and land use. The range of scenarios goes from an immediate reduction in emissions to an intensive fossil fuel use. This wide range allows us to make predictions of the future climate and provide useful best and worst case advice to policymakers. 
The UKSM is not the only Earth system model out there. There are models from research institutes and universities from around the world. Uh, it's important that they're there so that we can compare our model against other models, because if several groups of scientists independently reach the same conclusion, then we can have a lot more confidence in the results themselves. So the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project, or CMIP, outlines a set of rules, formats, and standards that make it easier for us to compare models. This includes a set of required simulations that each model must run, like produce a pre-industrial simulation for 150 years. And all CMIP models need to meet the same set of data quality and formats. This standardization allows us to build software frameworks like ESM Valtool, which make it very easy for scientists to take raw model data and convert it into a scientific result. Basically, by making standardized model data and tools freely available and easy to use, the scientific process is democratized and the barriers to entry are reduced. These CMIP6 datasets are the modeling backbone of the IPCC assessment reports. These reports were made to summarize our best understanding of the current state of the climate and its possible future trajectory. They were the scientific basis for international climate change policy agreements and they underpin the Paris Agreement and the recent COP26 agreement in Glasgow. The IPCC reports are each thousands of pages long, but the headline results are that human activities are unambiguously causing climate change. And if the world can substantially reduce emissions in the 2020s, then we may be able to limit the temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees. I personally believe that there's scope for climate optimism. For instance, 10 years ago, 40% of the UK's power was generated by coal, but now that number is less than 2% and still dropping. Similarly, more and more vehicles are going electric, here in Plymouth, we even have an electric ferry at Mountbatten. And similarly, while more forest is being destroyed than created, the rate of reforestation is rising every year, and reforestation is projected to outpace deforestation by the end of the decade. So a lot of people ask me what they can do in their own life to help with climate change. And well, the answer is a bit different for everybody, but what you can do is look at your personal climate impact and make changes in your travel, your diet, your energy use, or your personal investments, and that can have an impact. So just to summarize, Earth system models like the UKSM represent our best understanding of nature, and they take huge efforts from teams of scientists around the world to produce. Every single step in every component model is built from validated theory, a laboratory experiment, or a field observation and the science is verified each step along the way. In addition, all of our programming code, our data, our model description papers, and the tools that we use to evaluate them are all publicly available for free. We hear a lot about climate change in the news, and you will probably have come across some fairly dire predictions. Some people are skeptical that we can even make accurate predictions at all. It's my hope that through learning about how our models are built and how they work in my lecture here today, you'll leave with a better appreciation of their reliability and power while still being mindful of the limitations. In the wider context, the scientific output of the modeling community as a whole is being used to make policy decisions that affect all aspects of our lives, from what cars we drive, what we eat, what we wear, and where we live. So it's really important that we know what they are and how they work. These models really do allow us to summarize the state of the art science and our best understanding of the natural world together in one place. And while they're a great tool to understand the past climate, they're the best and the only tool that we have to understand the future of our climate.